ask, O oh God, that at this moment, O oh God, that you will forgive us of any injustice against you, O oh God. We ask, O oh God, that you would forgive us of just our, our own selves, O oh God our own passions, O oh God. We pray, O oh God, that at this moment that we may decrease and that you may increase, O oh God. I pray, O oh God, that you take control of my tongue, O oh God, and that you speak uh, freely, O oh God, through my, through my mouth. In your precious and holy name I pray. Uh, before I uh, start today's sermon, the original title of this message was living words and when I was with my wife yesterday and I would like to preach to my wife before uh, any sermon and I was with her she she uh, related to me she says those are actually two sermons so for the sake of you guys I have split this sermon into two parts so Today is Living Words, Part 1. Next time I'm up here, I will give you Living Words, Part 2. And maybe they'll give you some time to digest what I'm about to tell you. People often ask, what is the source of power? What is the source of power? Where do we get power from? A common answer to that is money. We often believe that power is tied to money. The problem is, history has, told, has shown us over and over and over again that the voice of even a small, poor man can hold as much weight as a rich man and can hold as much influence as any rich man. Our democracy is built on that, that very principle, that we are all equal in that matter. Some people say power is tied to the mind. If you are intelligent enough, you can wield power, and that makes sense. But how many of us know that there are a lot of stupid people holding high seats of power. We know them in our regular lives, right? There's a lot of stupid people holding high seats of power. So it can't be the minds. Some people say it's the heart. The heart. Passion. That's what's tied to power. But how many know of someone who's passionless and was just lucky enough to be at the right place at the right time and they hold significant power. So my question is, what is the source of power? What is it tied to? My answer to that is anything that can manipulate all three of those things. Words. Words can manipulate money. Words can manipulate the mind and the heart. You see, eloquent, eloquent words tied together can make you a lot of money. Anybody ever heard of the Wolf of Wall Street, Jordan Belfort? Jordan Belfort scammed his way through Wall Street, made hundreds of millions of dollars. And when, when the feds finally caught on, they took his fortunes away. He went to prison. You know what Jordan Bedford does now? Motivational speaking. He probably has more money today than he did when he was scamming Wall Street. Words can make money. Words can warp and manipulate the mind. David Koresh did this with the Branch Davidians. And we'll get to David Koresh in my next sermon because I have a big part there for him. Words 
can break, can change, and can mend the heart. I'm just going to go, I'm going to derail a little bit. Um, actually, not derail, but I'll tie it back together. My mother, excuse me. My mother, she, um, she does event decorating. And sometimes she gets hired to do some of these events. And she had this one wedding that she had to do. And she was going to put a bunch of roses in a vase floating in water. It was a beautiful concept. And the bride came and purchased the roses, delivered them to my mother a couple of days before the ceremony. And about two days in, my mother has those roses at the at the window trying to get them to blossom and the roses were not blossoming and it was only about another day or so for the for the ceremony so my mother goes into the into the room and she takes those roses and she starts kissing those roses and starts telling those roses you are beautiful i love you you know you're going to blossom to something great sure enough you take take what, uh, you know take what you want from this that was a beautiful wedding with nice blossomed roses. <laughs> but this is actually a common, uh, a common thing that people believe, right? It's a common, actually, experiment that people actually uh, engage in, right? The experiment usually takes two plants, right? One plant is put is placed in a different room, and the other plant is put in a in a separate room, and that. One plant, the owner of the plant will go into and say to the plant, how beautiful it is. Oh, you're so beautiful. You're growing so nicely. You're going to be something great. I can't wait to see you at your full potential. And then they'll go into the other room and, take, and tell the other plant, oh, how stupid you are. How ugly you are. I hope you just die. And... According to many accounts, the one flower that's, that's constantly being encouraged to grow and to do and to, to be its very best often flourishes. And the one that's constantly being brought down is the one that begins to decay and becomes um, and dies. The power of words. The power of words. That's what it makes me think of. Words are the most powerful thing that a human can possess. I just told you the three things that it can manipulate. Words inspire thought. They stimulate reason and they determine judgment. Words can either create and inspire life or destroy and inspire death. Words are so important that our forefathers found it necessary to protect it in the very first amendment. Through the, through the protection of freedom of speech and freedom of press. And here's the interesting thing. If I just control just one of those things, whether press or speech, I can manipulate the other. I want to give you an example of how powerful words are by taking two men who probably did it the best in two different drastic ways. And you'll be surprised by the first one, Adolf Hitler. Through carefully choice words and extreme passion, Adolf Hitler was able to rise in a democratic society, in a free country, by appealing to nationalistic ideology. He convinced people that the Aryan brotherhood, I'm sorry, the Aryan race was the most superior race on the face of the earth. He was able to manipulate thousands to follow him, to fight for him, to die for him, despite the fact that he did not fit the criteria of the Aryan race. By his words, he led millions of Jews 
to death. Originally, this, this sermon was supposed to be preached on Martin Luther King's Day, and I, couldn't, I can't find anybody better to give a contrast to than Martin Luther King Jr. himself. Martin Luther King Jr. helped inspire social and political revolutions without ever picking up a weapon or ever submitting to violence, but just using words. Through his words, Martin Luther King inspires generations to come. And still, and, and his, his words continue to do something to us. And, his, and it did something the very moment he said, I have a dream. And just a little excerpt from that, from that, that speech that I love the most. I have a dream, he says, that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. Dr. King understood the impact of his words when he said this very, very thing. Our lives begin to end the day we become silent about the things that matter. Words are powerful. And though Dr. King's life was cut short, his words continue to impact our social, political, and justice systems. And though we may have a lot of ways to go, there is no doubt that if it wasn't for the dream, if it wasn't for the words, we may still be waiting for a black president. God spoke life into existence. The Bible doesn't say that God stood around his workshop for a million years and said, and drew out the plans of the universe. No, the Bible says in Genesis, God said, let there be light. And there was light. God said, let us separate the waters above from the waters below. God said, rise from the, from, from the waters, dry land. God said, I'll put the moon here and the sun here and the stars here. God spoke and birds filled the skies and the fish filled the seas. And God spoke and suddenly beasts roamed the earth. And God spoke and man was created. There is something powerful about words when it can create. But it is also something powerful when it can also destroy. How powerful are the words of our words? If we just go back into the Bible, that very moment in Egypt was probably defined when Moses said, Let my people go. It inspired, it pushed forward. Or what about David? When David said, he declared, Hey, the same God that saved me, that delivered me from the claws of a lion and the paws of a bear, that same God is going to deliver me from that Philistine. Even when things seemed impossible, he declared this. David went on to become the king of Israel. And whether we want to believe it or not, words matter. Words matter. And as children of God, our words matter more. Even when we believe that they don't. As Christians, we are judged on a different standard. And not just by the world. We're judged by a higher standard by God. As Christians, we are to be ambassadors of righteousness and are expected to operate accordingly. If we speak like the world, how is the world supposed to recognize Christ in us? And I'm not just talking about profanity, right? I could tell you I am the most unchristian person on the, on the highway. 
I think many of us are, right? Especially when that guy cuts them. I'm not just talking about profanity. I'm talking about the substance of the words we use and the reasons and why we use them. Some of, us, some of us actually believe that as Christians, we have the authority to impose our words in the name of Christ. While the reasoning behind those, those words may not be to uplift the kingdom, but to fulfill our own selfish agendas. Maybe it's to fulfill our egos. Maybe it's to make us feel a little bit more important. To give us a sense of power. Maybe it's to even abuse that power. To inflict vengeance probably. In order to cause guilt. Or maybe it's to feed our own self-righteousness. Words are like seeds. And you're either going to sow wheat or you're going to sow weeds. To what words are you sowing into your neighbor's life? What words are you sowing into your friend's life? What words are you sowing into your marriage? What words are you sowing into your children's life? What words are you sowing into your own life? Our words don't only just uh, affect the people that we direct them to, but it also affects the people that we indirect, that, that are indirectly associated with that person. Deep-rooted words can affect communities and families for generations. I want to read something from Matthew 12, 37. It's a little lengthy. I'll try to do it as best as I can. Either, either make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For a tree is known by its fruit. Broad vipers, I can, t I, I can you, how can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good man, out of the treasure, good treasures of his heart, brings forth good things. And an evil man, out of the evil treasures, brings forth evil things. But I say to you, for every idle word men, uh, men may speak, they will give an account of it on the day of judgment. For by the words you were justified, and by your words you will be condemned. There's power in words. I want you to hear this. Let this one sink. Words are a manifestation of the condition of the heart. What we fill our hearts with is expressed through our mouths and only confirms what we entertain in our lives. So what language are we speaking in? Are we speaking in the language of death? As in the, in the same concept of the, of the plan. What are words of death though? Very simple. Words of death are anything designed to destroy, divide, and deceive. It is the, wor it's the language of the world that we know and that we live in. It's survival of the fittest. The language takes its root and is watered through sin. Matthew 15, 11 says, What goes into someone's mouth does not defile them, but what comes out of their mouth, that is what defiles them. When we express negative words and opinions onto others, we alter, we can alter their perspective of the world around them. We can affect their thought process and their reasonings. We could contribute to a poor life choices and negative behavior. We can destroy someone's self-worth and self-esteem. More importantly, we can keep them away from the cross and salvation. Well, that sounds a little too harsh, right? That can't be mean. That words of death. That's not something that I, have to, I could be associated with. Maybe we don't even realize that we're doing it. And I'm just going to run through a couple of things. And you, you think to yourself, maybe this relates to me. Have you ever gossiped about your neighbor? Have you ever said something that you regret out of anger? Have you ever lied to protect your own interests? 
Have you ever passed judgment without knowing the facts? Have you ever deliberately caused someone guilt, shame, and pain through your words? Have you ever laced your words with discrimination either against race, religion, gender, sexual orientation, etc.? Have you ever laced your words with profanity in front of others in order to engage in conversation? Have you ever diminished someone's self-esteem and self-worth by con constantly criticizing and magnifying their faults and flaws? I'm not talking to anybody here, right? It's safe to say that most of us maybe have at least one of the things or if not most of the things that I just explained. It is not only the words that we direct at each other that we are communicating in the language of death, but it's also the words that we direct at ourselves. How many of us have said this to ourselves? God, I'm ugly. I'm not smart. I'm not talented. I'm a failure. I'm not good enough. I hate myself. I can't. I'm disabled. I'm too sick. I'm too young. I'm too old. I'm not worth it. I should have never been born. Somewhere in life, someone spoke these terrible words to you and you decided to repeat them. When you are doing this, you are engaging in self-destructive behavior. And if we destroy ourselves, how can we uplift our brothers and sisters? It'll be no different than a dog trying to teach a cat to, to bark. Les Brown, uh, I was listening to one of his uh, motivational, spe um, motivational speeches and he was talking about how words impacted his life and he said something that I had to just write, write down. A high school teacher once told him, do not let someone's opinion of you become your reality. How many of us have spoken this language? But better yet, how many of us are still speaking in this language? Or are we communicating in the language of life? The language of life. What is the language of life? What are, how can I recognize the words of life? Well, the words of life is anything that's going to bring about righteousness, love, and peace. The language of, of, of life is spoken by our Most High God. And then it's expressed through the fruits of the Spirit. It is rooted and is watered through holiness. When we speak life unto others, we can change their perspective to see the world in Christ's eyes. It convicts their spirit. It can contribute to good choices, life choices, and good behavior. It can uplift somebody's self-esteem and, and provide them a, a sense of value and self-worth. More importantly, it can bring them to the cross and bring them to salvation. 1 Peter 3.10 He who would love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. The language of love. And I'm going to close out on the with the language of love. Are we speaking? Are, are our words grounded when we speak to others? Are they grounded in love? Are our words slow to anger? Does it delight itself in truth? Is our words slow to judgment but quick to mercy? Are our words inspiring healing? Do they protect? Do they uplift? Are our words laced with encouragement? Do they convict the spirit? Are they filled with thanksgiving? Are they filled with praise and worship? Are our 
our words laced with humility? Are they inspiring spiritual growth? In the same manner, it's equally important to speak life into ourselves. I want you to turn to the person next to you, and I want you to tell them, I look good today. I am beautiful. I am smart. I am important. You know why? Because I am filled with gifts and talents. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I love myself. No, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. I can move that mountain. I can defeat that giant. I can scale those walls. Hallelujah. I will part the seas to get to my promise. I can walk through the valley of the shadow of death and I will fear no evil. Hallelujah. I am able. I am worth it. I have purpose. I am strong and I will not be defeated. I am at the right age at the right time and I was created for such a time as this. I am blessed and highly favored. I am created in the perfect and holy image of the Most High God. Ephesians 4, 29, 30 says, Let no corrupt word proceed out of my mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. When we do this, we are empowering ourselves with the power of the Holy Spirit. We are affirming our faith and demonstrating righteousness. And most importantly, we are speaking the language of life. What language are you speaking unto others? What words are you telling yourself? Choose your words wisely. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we come before you and we just take this opportunity to just lay our tongues at your feet, oh God. We ask, oh God, that you cleanse us of all unrighteousness, that you teach and convict our spirits to do good, to say good. To help us to, to speak in the language of love and life. Thank you, O oh God, for your forgiveness. Thank you, O oh God, for your righteousness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And I just want to end with this last verse. Psalms 1914. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen.